bringing a player over, there's an adjustment period for a lot of players. There's adjustment periods for free agents in the States changing teams, um, if that's the only organization they've known. In this case, it's a much bigger cultural shift. Um, you, you want, it's in your interest as a team to set that person up for success. Did you observe anything? Did you do anything? Like, give me the kind of entourage that should be put together behind the scenes. Well, I mean, first, you know he's signing that big deal. Hey, the contract was astronomical again. It was the biggest contract you'll ever have, Shohei Otani. Then, I mean, listen, as an agency, what do you get? Four, five, six percent? Some? I mean, you do the numbers. That's millions and millions of dollars for this agency. You got to put together everything. Maybe a cook, maybe an interpreter in the agency, you know, that you can, you know, give. 60 to 80,000 a year and they'd be happy with that, you know, to help around, to make sure everything's right. Uh, make sure somebody's, you know, if he needs help, fly somebody out there, you know, that kind of stuff. Some, some of these things, they just don't go over your head. You know what I mean? Like these guys are smart. So you, you got to have an entourage of people to help out. And I, <clears throat> I think that's where, you know, a lot of people are at fault during this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Financial advisors, accounting, all of that. Yeah. You, you should have, resources galore and resources you know that can speak the language if need be i get it for otani he he doesn't want to deal with this stuff but just initially you got to put the team together so that you got a, a trusted group that can deal with all of this and it's not just you know your interpreter taking on many other responsibilities that he shouldn't be in charge of regardless an interpreter that first, was a sign yeah that was assigned to him don't forget that mm. He didn't. Yeah, pick he didn't the pick it. So the, and the and the so interpreter also had a sketchy resume that clearly was not picked. I'm not talking about the Dodgers. I'm I'm talking about the Angels too. I mean, now we know. Now the we know. For years. He duped. He duped people. He but got him. There, there's a lot of fault for Shohei not taking care of his junk, as AJ was saying yesterday. But it's also. Like when you're bringing a player over, you have a responsibility to make sure the people around them are are, are that they, that they check out because you're bringing somebody to a country that they don't know the language very well, they don't know how to get around. He took his money. He was a liar. They put somebody in his life that was a liar and a thief. And there's some responsibility there for the angels because they put this connection how much responsibility i don't know but if i'm shohei i have to start taking care of all this stuff myself yeah you got to reassemble the team let's bring in our first guest we can ask him about this for sure a uh, longtime executive in baseball uh, zach scott joining us right now excited to have him on you can give him a good follow he's uh very well spoken on twitter at zach scott sports has his own pod his own company is running. We'll get into that as well. Zach, good to see you, man. How you doing? Hey, guys. Good to see you. Thanks for uh, having me on. I'm enjoying all the uh, Shohei and his taking care of his junk talk. That's <laughs> <laughs> That was that big was yesterday. That was big I, on the show. <laughs> uh, so let, let's start there. From your perspective, what's your take on the story? And from an organization perspective, is there anything that could have been done differently to help a player that is coming over from another country. We all know anybody that's visited another country that doesn't know the culture, or you just get confused on anything. You're like in a cab, you're like, I don't know what to do. You know, it, I get it. So yeah. what have you observed? I'm sure you obviously, you know, oversaw um, transactions where players came over from overseas and you had to work on making sure that they were comfortable. Yeah, I mean, the biggest one for us at the Red Sox was Daisuke Matsuzaka uh, back in uh, 07. Um, so. I think you you hit it on the head with it's a vulnerable position for the player to be in coming to a completely different culture um you know obviously not the language just all these factors so i think it's really important that the team gets the supporting cast right and it's easy for me to say you know the angels didn't do a good job with that but you know it sounds like the story's pretty wild and obviously there's a lot more that we'll i'm sure we'll still learn um but you know it's it sounds like it's it's hard to kind of see through a, a con man sometimes and that's kind of what seems like was going on here but yeah it's it's really crucial i can recall 
when we brought in Daisuke and at the same time Okajima and getting the support staff right was important to Scott Boris, who was Daisuke's agent and to the organiz to the Red Sox, because this was new for us to have a, uh, put an infrastructure in place for a Japanese player in the clubhouse. Uh, there are a lot of issues that come with that. You need to have the right interpreter, the right, oftentimes they'll want their own massage therapist. And, you know, then you're dealing with issues that of fairness within the clubhouse is this, this guy's getting special treatment, but at the same time, it's such a unique circumstance. It warrants that. So there's a lot of logistical things that go into it, but I remember how important it was that we found found the right fit because they're not only the right fit for that person who's in an, in who's in an, um, a vulnerable spot coming over to the states but they have to fit into the clubhouse and and that unique culture that is a major league clubhouse as as you know you guys know do you think any of this has to do with the fact that you guys knew you were getting dice cream matsusaka and he was coming in and i didn't freudian slip there for our for our podcast he loved ice cream so it was dice k was dice cream but he was an established star do you think any of this i hate to use the word laziness by the angels was because you were essentially getting shohei otani could he be unbelievable yes it's amazing but it's like hey you know what we're we're paying this guy the minimum right now and he's not you know they're not paying it we see him as shohei otani now 700 million dollar player you have to have all your ducks in a row. You have to make this super big pitch to get him to sign with your team. Do you think some of that was part of the laziness or do you think, no, we're going to treat every single, the, 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 the Padres are, are treating Yuki Matsui the same way they treated Shohei Otani or Yamamoto the same way they treated Shohei Otani back in 2017 when they signed him? Well, I think, first of all, Shohei, I mean, he had been on, team's radars for years right it, it, because of the circumstances sure he didn't cost the team a lot uh, in salary uh it was very unique um but everyone knew he was or everyone assumed he was going to be a star everyone was really excited about him i remember, I remember talking about him, i felt like for like four years before he even came over um so i don't think that people weren't thinking that about that um, yeah, sure. The money in a sense has something to do with it. If you're dealing with, again, going back to, to dice cream, um, you're dealing with, you know, a big dollar, Scott Boris, you know, part of the negotiation is putting those types of that type of support staff into the contract. So there's a different level, I guess, of importance put on it at that moment. But no, I think they, anyone that was was getting Shohei knew they had a star on their hands, knew that they had to, you know, part of the benefit <clears throat> of bringing a player over. There's an adjustment period for a lot of players. There's adjustment periods for free agents in the States changing teams. Um, if that's the only organization they've known in this case, it's a much bigger cultural shift. Um, you, you want, it's in your interest as a team to set that person up for success, take away any possible distractions, just set them up to be focused on baseball so you can get them performing at their peak level as fast as possible. I want to switch gears here a little bit. I, I love some of the tweets that you've been putting, <clears throat> excuse me, along as you, uh, you know, work your way through the social media a little bit. So for me, you put a tweet up and, and I quote, the fastest way to kill a big market team is by locking up too many players to long-term contracts, mainly covering post-prime years. Luckily, someone bailed out my socks. So for me, my question to you is, does this have anything to do with like a Mike Trout contract? Is there anything like specific or is there an example that you have when, when you make this type of tweet? Well, I'll use the example of the Red Sox that I referenced there. When we signed Carl Crawford and Adrian Gonzalez to those big deals at that time, in the market, I mean, those, those were, those were huge deals. You're now locking up multiple roster spots to these big long-term deals. We also had sizable contracts with Josh Beckett and some other players. You're just limiting your flexibility. And the, what I'm the point I'm making there is that's really the fastest way to, um, put yourself in a bind where you can't maneuver around a player disappointing on that contract. You need to have the financial flexibility to be able to address that. I mean, the good thing about being a big market club and having a large payroll 
is that you can you can get away with more mistakes on the free agent market. Um, I mean, we again on a different scale had a similar thing with with Pablo Sandoval and Hanley Ramirez. I mean, you need to be able to have either the young players that are in their first six years of control that are making less than they're producing or less than they would get if they were free agents to kind of balance that risk that you're taking when you're kind of going all in on these on these free agents. Um, but I think we've seen that. And I referenced some other teams, um, you know, the Mets, bat, you know, by everyone still talks about Bobby Bonilla contract still being on the books. But the, yeah. those Mets um, and, you know, I think a really good example is the Phillies after they won the World Series in 08. They basically wanted to keep the band together, right? So they just kept signing those guys well into their 30s and didn't have the farm system to recover from that when those guys, some of those guys inevitably declined. They just didn't have the maneuverability to pivot and still put out a really good team. And, and that's really the point that I'm making there is that it's just, it can be, it can be challenging if you have too many contracts uh, guaranteed on the books. Now, my point <clears throat> coming off of this, I've always, everybody talks about a big market and small market. All these teams, they have money. <clears throat> I never understood why, oh, just they're a big market team because, well, maybe because they live in this. New York's a big city. I get it. But all these teams have the money to spend on these guys. Can we agree to that? Or, I mean, that's just something that's always bothered me by saying, oh, man, this team can't get this guy. They sure as hell can get the guy to do They got money. These guys wouldn't be in this business if they couldn't. Sure. I I mean, it's hard. I've only worked full time for two teams that were big market teams in Boston, and New York. Um, I have consulted with some smaller market clubs, and I definitely see a different mindset with some of those owners. Um, you know, some of them sometimes it's you know they want to keep the team and the family, um, they want to have full ownership, so they they don't do what some other owners do, which is kind of sell off some pieces some minority stakes of the team in order to get more cash infused into the operation that they can invest in the product. So there's different ways they can do it. They have some ability to borrow against the franchise value. So yeah, there's ways to do it. I think we saw the Padres invest very heavily after being thrown into the small market category for so many years. Um, now we don't get to see the books of these clubs, right? That's not, they're private. So we don't get, get a look inside that, but you know, some of these teams are uh, probably a lot of these teams are operating at a loss that are in markets where they or they don't sell out all the time, um, depending on the TV deals. And now that's a whole other issue right now with with uh, what's been going on with the, the Diamond Group, that RSN situation. But, you know, I do think some teams do operate at a loss, but it's also another way to look at it is investing the product and you know, using the Padres again as an example they start spending a lot and unfortunately it hasn't turned into consistent results on the field winning uh, i think they've only made one postseason appearance since investing a lot but their attendance figures i believe have gone way up in the excitement level around the team and i'm guessing viewership's gone up and all these other things that can increase revenues for them so there is some level of what i find is sometimes oh, some owners look at it too much as a cost rather than an investment uh, and that's not just limited to players. There's other things, you know, that I do with my business where I see it as, okay, if we invest in this area of your baseball operation, it will pay off down the road. And, can, you know, biggest, a big part of the challenge of getting that investment from your CFO or your ownership is for them to see the return on that um, and to not think of it just as an expense or a cost. And I think sometimes some people think of that, their talent is that, which is kind of crazy because that is the product that they're selling right and they should be competitive but you think that they got in this business you know i've heard steve cohen say this i'm not in this business to make money i'm in this business to win and bring a championship to to a city is that refreshing to hear him say that is that refreshing to hear and somebody who ultimately is in charge of the team whether you think the gm or the president of baseball operations is in charge the owner if the owner wants to win he's willing to do He's willing to do what it takes. And is, is that refreshing when you're working with, whether now or when you're with the Red Sox or Mets, to hear that? Yeah, and like I said, I've always been in a fortunate spot where we were spending quite a bit of money on payroll. Um, so, you know, and being, we get in this game because we're competitive and we want to win. And to have that support 
it always feels good. Um, you know, that said, it comes with risk. There's all different kinds of risk. Not spending is a risk uh, to an organization. Um, overspending, like I said before, can be a risk where if those guys don't perform and you haven't left that flexibility, you're in a tough spot. You can have several losing years because of that. So I definitely prefer to have that support for sure. Um, and then it's up to the general manager and his staff to his or her staff to figure out how best to use those dollars so they can can win now and in the future. When you guys, meaning Steve Cohen and you started taking over the Mets, there was a culture shift that needed to happen. How, how do you first go about doing that? Do you sit there and, cause I read and listened to one thing you were talking about, how you were like, you can't just come in and start axing people and bringing in all your best buds because that doesn't work out. How does that start? Is it a listening process? Is it a, I've met all these people throughout my career, I start bringing some in? What does that process start? Because you said there might have been PTSD from what had happened before with with the Wilpons in, in ownership. Yeah, I'd say it's, you know, there's a lot of listening that has to happen uh, first. In, in, in my case, to put some context in it, I didn't arrive at the Mets until very late December. I started there the day after Christmas of um, 2020. So I'd already gone through an off season with the Red Sox, almost an entire off season with the Red Sox. So I was focused on helping, you know, them build a team for 2021. And then when I did get to the Mets, you know, first it was an assistant GM role. And then about a, less than a month later, it was sliding into the acting GM role. Um, so it was a unique set of circumstances with timing. So at that point you have a lot of the, free agents are kind of off the market. They had already, before I arrived, um, let go of several people in key leadership spots. So we had positions to fill. So there was a lot of new blood and a new culture opportunity, uh, kind of organically already set up to bring in some new people. But yeah, as far as everyone that was still there, to me, if you move too fast, you, there's a risk that you you know, move on from some good people that were maybe just in a bad sick circum, you know, under bad circumstances. And so I wanted to really understand the people that were there, what they brought to the table, where they best would fit, where they could help the organization best long term uh, to achieve the goals that we had, which is obviously to build a winner uh, that competes for a championship as frequently as possible. So yeah, I mean, I did find, like I mentioned, the uh, there were a lot of people there that seemed to be on edge in what I called PTSD, where, you know, almost like a lot of Mets fans seem to have on, <laughs> on social media, where it's just kind of expecting things to not go the way they want it. And, you know, to break through that mentality was to take some time to get them to, to know me and other people that were new there and to trust uh, that we had the right intentions in the right, vision for what we wanted the organization to be, but it takes time. It takes time to understand where your strengths and weaknesses are and to build off of that. Hey everybody, be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball, the way it should be covered.